I responded to a call from a concerned woman who'd found an abandoned days old kitten under her porch. When I came to pick up the kitten, I had her sign a generic give up form that spelled out that euthanasia was a possibility, but I was instructed to repeatedly convey that we would do our absolute best. And so that's what I said, even as the woman described her careful search for an organization she knew would work around the clock to help this tiny being pull through. It was my job to make sure that I did not leave without that cat, that I said whatever necessary for the woman not to change her mind. The entire way back to PETA's Norfolk, Virginia headquarters, I sobbed, petting the infant kitten in my lap, telling her things would all be okay, even though in my gut I knew it wouldn't, that she never really had a chance. I even began plotting how I might take a detour and deliver her to a rehabber instead, but how could I explain a missing kitten to the woman waiting with the needle? I couldn't, so I complied without a word. Laura Lee Cascada, February 26, 2019. Another former PETA employee has come forward to speak about her experiences killing animals and the stifling cult-like atmosphere that pervades the organization, a culture she described as terrifying. Laura Lee Cascada adds to the chorus of other PETA employees that have shared similar stories, including Heather Harper Troge, who was the first field worker to come forward and who testified that she was told to lie to people to acquire animals, to steal animals, and to greatly overestimate the amount of barbiturates used to kill animals so that other animals could be killed surreptitiously off book. Like Heather, Laura paints a deeply disturbing portrait of an organization that terrorizes both animals and employees. Laura explains how she became an active participant in PETA's efforts to acquire animals to kill, which has claimed the lives of over 40,000 known victims in the last 19 years, including healthy puppies and kittens, many of them immediately after taking custody and without ever trying to find them homes. In some years, Upwards of 99% of animals PETA acquires are killed or displace others at local pounds who are killed. Her chilling account describes the method whereby employees are intimidated and emotionally manipulated into participating in the killing, an act that came to be euphemistically called to take care of an animal. Laura also describes numerous examples of healthy animals who were killed for the good of all animals. She writes that even trying to find homes for cats through rescue groups on her own time was frowned upon. There was the time that a family member was dying from cancer and needed help rehoming several cats. I created a post on Facebook in which I mentioned being open to the possibility of a trustworthy rescue stepping forward. She was chastised for doing so. The view by PETA leadership, she says, is that rescue groups we're usually fronts for massive hoarding operations with animals languishing in their own waste and perishing from a variety of ailments without any veterinary care. And animals would therefore be better off killed than sent to rescue groups. Another time, she writes, she rescued a healthy dog who her mom was willing to adopt. Excitedly, she says, she told supervisors, but never received a reply. He was killed, she later learned, without explanation. She also recounts the killing of a healthy bird. I rescued and cared for a pair of birds from a cruelty case for weeks, bonding with and growing to love them. When the decision was made to euthanize the boy because of a debilitating medical condition, the girl was also euthanized because it was thought that she would be lonely without him. She was one of those lumped into the unadoptable category PETA brushes past as it explains its euthanasia statistics each year. I was expected and required to swallow my emotions for her for the good of all animals, I was expected to welcome her death as a positive outcome in order to maintain my employment. She portrays a culture of paranoia, fear, and intimidation that resulted in employees being fired for questioning the decision to kill healthy animals. If an employee, like many animal rights advocates who believe in the rights and autonomy of each individual animal, wanted to critically assess whether a euthanasia decision was truly the best thing for an individual animal in his or her unique circumstances, there was a real true fear of being branded as an advocate for hoarding or a secret supporter of the enemy. Thus, speaking up could have meant being booted from the tribe. Very few dared to submit questions that remotely challenged the prevailing ideology. Ultimately, the culture was terrifying and desensitizing, 
and I gradually felt that my view of death, of taking animals' lives, was being warped, my emotions being stripped away. She describes the cult-like indoctrination of starry-eyed young people who begin working at PETA hoping to further the rights of animals, but instead become champions of harming them. As most new PETA employees are blooming animal rights activists, freshly plucked from college and determined to do whatever it takes to succeed in this demanding, low-paying activist world, PETA's methodology of indoctrination is quite successful. These employees soak it all in like a sponge, as I did at the age of 21 when I started there, and begin to spout the organization's sound bites at every turn. They will start to do so so naturally that they can't see where they themselves end and the organization begins. But there is hope. No lie can live forever. More and more employees are breaking the silence of complicity and more will no doubt come forward in time. In addition to Heather before her and others whose testimonials can be found in my book, Why PETA Kills, and the website of the same name, there is now Laura, and she reports that she has been inundated by others thanking her for her courage. Employees who have been too afraid to come forward with disturbing stories of what they too witnessed and participated in during their time at PETA. Since I finally spoke out on Facebook, I have heard anonymously from many. People whose work for animals in the community was attacked by PETA because it didn't fall in line with the organization's views on rescue work. Former employees who were forced to participate in euthanasias they didn't believe in. People who were fired because they refused to do so. With time, those voices, which she says number in the dozens and maybe hundreds, will add to the growing chorus about who and what PETA really is, and when enough of them do, Virginia officials who have turned a knowingly blind eye to PETA's deadly actions will finally be forced to act, and Ingrid Newkirk and her acolytes at PETA will finally be held accountable, justice will prevail, and most important of all, the killing will end. When that day comes, everyone who assisted Newkirk in her dark and disturbing impulses, who championed her in spite of the killing, or who bore silent witness to the atrocities against animals committed at PETA, will also have to account for how they could claim to be part of a movement founded on the protection of the very individuals whose corpses fill up the four barrels in the little shed next to PETA's headquarters day in and day out, week by week, month by month, each and every year, again and again and again. You can find links to Laura's article, an interview with Heather Harper Troge, who earlier came forward, testimonials by other PETA employees, and learn more at whypetakills.com.